Okay, we are recording. Okay, so how the notes are structured are that if also if you're watching this afterwards and you're you want the notes, please message me. I'm on Facebook as Tiffany Yong. But yes, um, how how I structure the notes is that it looks long, but Galbraith likes to test uh, definitions. So what we're gonna roll with is that I'm just gonna briefly say some like definitions sometimes. And you just need to like get the vibe of the definition. And if you don't understand any part of the definition or you feel like you can't, you're not able to memorize it because you can't understand it, then you can stop me at any time. And then some other useful, I also have theorems that are useful for problem solving. So that's just like, a yeah, a, uh, some, some theorem that you can apply in order to solve problems that he will throw at you. Okay, so we can get started. The first theorem is that it, the first theorems are all related to exponentials. So log x to the power of a equals to a log x. Okay, first theorem. Second theorem, log x plus log y equals to log x y. Okay, now third theorem is that k to the power of x plus k to the power of y equals to k to the power of x plus y. And yeah, if y'all can see this, or if you can't see it at any point in time, you can just let me know. Sounds good? Okay. So that's all the arithmetic stuff. I feel like all the other mm -hmm. stuff related to arithmetic isn't really something that I can help with. So that's just like, log rules are useful. And not, anyone, not everyone has seen them before. So let's move on. So the next part is all about probability. Okay. So when do you even need a probability in the first place? That's when you have a random experiment. So in the notes, I define a random experiment as an experiment where you don't know the outcome beforehand. You can be very sure that it happens, but you still don't know the outcome beforehand because, because of some reason or another. Like, I can be very sure that if there are dark clouds right above me, it, it'll, it will rain soon. But it's like, there's still a probability. Like, what's the probability that it will rain soon? Like, 0 0.99 is still not one. So, random experiment. Next thing, A complement is everything that is not an A. So I will draw you a neat little Venn diagram. Here's the, here's the space of outcomes. Actually, I shouldn't confuse you with this. Okay, Here's all the things that can happen. It's a rectangle for some odd reason. It doesn't matter. Okay, And then here's everything that we call A. You can define A as anything you like. So what's A complement? So everything that's A is inside this circle, right? A complement is everything outside. So it's all the, ooh. that's a complement. Next thing, another nice rectangle. Here we have a, event a, and then we introduce a new event, event b. Okay? And so a, Union B is everything that is in either A or B. So it's everything that's in this little infinity like thing, everything in there. And then A intersection B is everything that is in both A and B. So it's everything in the center here. So this is just like recap. I'm fairly certain that many of you would know this. We didn't just move through it. And we have a theorem that the probability of A 
union B equals to the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A intersection B. So why is this theorem true? If I want to count the probability that of everything where either A or B happens, then I would count the probability that A happens, add with the probability that B happens. But then if you just add them, oh, I just realized someone's in the rainbow. I should actually close the rainbow. Give me a second. Okay. So if you add them, you realize that what you're doing is you're double counting everything in the middle. Because you count this part and then you count this part, but then the center part was counted twice. Well, what's the center part? It happens to be the intersection as we defined before. So this is a rule and this rule is true. Okay. I th all clear here? Okay. I guess I'll move to mutual exclusivity first. Okay. A and B are mutually exclusive. Oh, thanks for the thumbs up. Very appreciated. If A is like this and B is like this, meaning there's nothing that overlaps between A and B. So it's like th these are just disjoint things, right? So what does this mean? That means that the intersection, the probability of the intersection of A and B equals to zero. Because where's the intersection? There's no intersection. And the intersection of A and B equals to the empty set. This is the empty set symbol. It just means that there's nothing there. So if you're trying to look for everything that is in both A and both and both A and B, you'll find that, oh, okay, there's nothing. This means that the union of A and B is probability of A plus probability of B minus the union, uh, the intersection of A and B, but the intersection of A and B is zero. So the union of A and B is just the probability of A and the probability of B. And if you look at it, it kind of makes sense you, because you, you're just counting this and you're counting this, you're not double counting anything. So it's no problem at all. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, okay. I guess I will move to the laws on set operations. All of these were mostly, sorry. Yes, this recording will be made available on the ESA YouTube. So all of these notes are actually mostly taken from Galbraith's notes. The only difference is that instead of having like 50 pages of notes to go through, now you have like six, which is, which is a win to me, I think. Yeah, okay. So here's the rules regarding set operations. One. They call it commutativity. If it helps you remember, you can remember what the words mean, or like you can remember the actual terminology of it. But if it does not help you remember, then I don't think there is a point in learning this word because I also don't know these words. Second one is associativity. Third one is this activity. And the fourth one will be a special one that we're covering later. Okay, so commutativity. First things first, it's that A intersection B is the same thing as B intersection A. And if you go back to the Venn diagram that I drew just now, it kind of makes sense, right? The intersection of A and B is the intersection of B and A. Like if you call it a different name, it's still the same thing. Same thing works for union. A union B equals to B union A. So 
everything that's in this middle blob, it doesn't matter if you say everything that's everything that's in either A or B is the same thing as everything that's in either B or A. So whenever all the probability stuff gets confusing, just turn it into words and then it just makes sense. Bye bye to the Venn diagram. Okay, next one is that A intersection B intersection C equals to A intersection B intersection C, which equals to <laughs> A, no bracket here, sorry, A intersection B intersections. This is honestly for the same reasons as just now, if you draw that little Venn diagram and then you have your A, B, and C. You're just referring to this one section in the middle. However you refer to it, it doesn't matter. So if I say, I take the intersection of A and B, I get this blob. And that intersection of C, I get the center blob. Or I could also take the intersection of B and C, and then I get this blob. T take the intersection of A, I get this blob. No, sorry. This is the intersection of A and C. My mistake. I'll say that again. If I take the intersection of B and C, you get this blob. If I take the intersection of A for this blob, I get this center blob again. So like, the blobs are the same. You can call it the same thing. It, it is the same thing. Finally, distributivity. Well, not finally. Yes. Okay. So, by the way, this also applies for the union, but <laughs> I'm fairly certain that like you can see it, and I, this is just a quick review, so we can go straight into the actual like problem solving part. Okay. A intersection B union C equals to A intersection B union A intersection C. So this one goes whoop, goes whoop, and then this happens. Yeah? It's like if you're saying A minus, no, actually, no, never mind. Analogy doesn't work. But yeah, okay. Um, okay. These, I'm fairly certain you don't need to remember that much. You don't need to like know the names. Just feel that this is how this works. The only actual sort of like maybe difficult thing here is this one. You have to remember this one. Yeah? Because there will be many times where you'll have like compound intersections or unions, and that's when you would need it. Okay, so this one, remember it. It's called distributivity since it's distributed. Same applies with the union and intersection. Actually, I'll just write it down for you. A union B intersection C equals to A union B intersection A union C. Yeah? Okay, these two, remember, very important. Next thing, the Morgan's Law. That one is also a little annoying to remember. I'll just Okay, so easy way to remember it. You take the complement of A intersection B intersection C, right? So whoo. as soon as you see this, if you don't want to deal with this, you just turn it into A. But then you can't, you have you have to flip, switch the like switch the signs around. So intersection becomes union, B, union, C. So the easy way to remember it is that like the complement is taken across the whole thing. So you can't just split it up into the smaller parts without swapping anything. So you have to swap this cat into like this intersection into a union. Same thing with the, 
other version, A union B union C, if I take the intersection of all of that, what I have is A complement intersection B complement intersection C. This is also very important because sometimes you run into a problem that is very annoying. Like imagine that you only, you're trying to get to this value, but you only have this, this, and this. If you want to go, if you don't remember this rule, you'll have to go through the long way of taking this complement, this complement, this complement in order to get A, B, and C, and then take the intersection of A, B, and C, and then you take the complement of all of that. You can do it, but it's annoying. And how do you avoid annoying things? It's by just remembering rules that help you avoid annoying things. Okay, is that clear? Okay, it's clear. We'll move on to exhaustiveness. Exhaustiveness seems really useless when you first learn it, but it is useful for one very specific and very useful thing that is used in basically all problem solving. So a sequence of events are exhaustive. I say a sequence of events, but that's because I can say A and B are exhaustive if It's like this, A, B. Okay, so A happens, B happens, means that the whole space is covered. It could also be something really gross, like this is A and this is B. Or it could literally even be like, this one little circle here is B and everything else is A, it doesn't matter. Okay, it just means that the entire space is covered by A and B. But why I say a sequence of events, A1, A2, A3, A4, like all the way to AN, is because of like, let's say I have A1, A2, A3, A4. Then they are exhaustive in the same way if it's like this, A1, A2, A3, A4, or any weird combination of it that covers the entire space. It could even be that they have an intersection somewhere. This is A1, this is A2, this is A3, this is A4. Doesn't matter, as long as they cover the whole thing. Yeah? Okay. And here's why exhaustiveness and mutual exclusivity is useful. If I combine those two things, I get something pretty powerful, okay? So I want to find the probability that event B happens. What I claim to you, this is equal to the probability of A intersection B plus probability of A complement intersection B. Why is that the case? So draw our nice little Venn diagram again. Want to find the probability of B happening. And here is A. If I take the intersection of A with B, as well the intersection of A complement with B, you can see that I get everything back, right? because A and A complement are exhaustive. So they cover the whole set. So if I, and not only that, but they're mutually exclusive because we're, so we're not double counting at any point in time. So this would be the case where probability of A intersection B is this, the probability of A complement intersection B would be this. And you know what? They add up to the probability of B. And this example is really, like this kind of thing is really powerful. It works more than just for A and A complement. So I'll give an example. And so in example 2.1, it says a traffic light is either red, yellow, or green. Okay, I'll, I'll keep this. 
No, I should. There's not enough space. Sorry, this board is tiny. Okay. A traffic light is either red, yellow, or green. Red, yellow, <laughs> or green. The probability that a car drives through the intersection and the light is red is 0 0.01. Probability. I'll say the car drives through with like with the event D because I don't want to write drive through three times. So D intersection R equals to 0 0.01. The probability that the car drives through the intersection and the light is yellow is 0 0.09. So probability of y, um, D intersection Y is 0 0.09. The probability that the car drives through the intersection and the light is green, D intersection G, is 0 0.9. So what's the probability that the car drives through the intersection? Well, the first thing you notice is that the light is always either red, yellow, or green. And the light can't be red and green at the same time, or red and yellow at the same time. or like So it's like either of them are happening. So if I want to take the find the probability that the car drives through, logically, all I have to do is, okay, what's the probability that the car drives through and the light is red? What's the probability that the car drives through and the light is yellow? What's the probability that the car drives through and the light is green? And if I add them all up, then I've covered all the cases. The light is either red, yellow, or green, right? So then if I would add all of this up, then it goes to one. But this number doesn't matter. I invented it. What's important is that you realize that this equals to the probability of D. Because R union Y union G is the whole space. Like this is everything that can possibly happen. So if I take the intersection of D with literally everything that can possibly happen, and all their intersections are nothing, then I would get the probability of D back. Does that make sense? Yes, exactly. So then this means that R, Y, and G are exhaustive. But you have to take care because the only way that this works, the reason why this works is that R, Y, and G are all mutually exclusive. So if the light can be red and yellow at the same time, then this doesn't hold anymore because there is, there is an intersection between the light being red and the light being yellow, then it will, it will change the probability and it won't hold anymore. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Next thing, conditional probability. This, let me just, oh wait, there's a nicer duster here. Ah, much nicer, okay. Conditional probability. The probability that A happens given that we already know that B has happened, equals to the probability of A intersection B divided by the probability of B. If you don't understand why this works, this is just something that you have to remember. And you have to have to have to remember this because this is like one of the most important things. Yeah? And so because of this, the probability of A <laughs> complement given B equals to one minus the probability of A given B. And yeah, this is just something like, if you know that B happens, what's the probability that A complement happens? It's one minus the probability that A happens given that B has happened. It's if you want, you can stare at this for a while and you will figure it out after like 
I'd say 10 minutes maybe, or you can just remember it. And if you remember it, it's like, yes, you just know it, so it's fine. Yeah, make sense? And then the another thing is that the probability of A happening equals to the probability of A given B times the probability of B plus the probability of A given B complement times the probability of B complement. This is more complicated. This one I kind of have to explain how it works. So what, how I want to find the probability of A is that I know A happens Given B that have that given that B has happened, A happens this much. So then what I would get over here, if I multiply by the probability of B, is I would get the probability of A intersection B. Then now the probability of A given that B complement has happened, multiplied by the probability of B complement, equals to the probability of A given B complement. If you add them all up, it goes back to the same thing for the same reason that I mentioned before. Make sense? Okay, yeah, this is just like, honestly, if you're ever confused in an exam, there's only a few things that you need to remember. This is one of them. All of the definitions are what you need to remember, because if you mess around with the numbers for long enough, I'm pretty sure you could find a way to get back A. If you knew this rule, you could just like multiply by the probability of B and you could kind of figure it out. But if you don't know this one, you're sunk. There's nothing that can save you because it's a definition. So it's not something that you can derive. People just decided one day, this is how it is. Okay, next thing, base theorem. Okay, okay, I should speed up a little. Okay, base theorem. Probability of A given B equals to the probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. This follows from the definition of conditional probability. You could derive it or you can just remember it. But like, I'm pretty sure that the derivation is simple enough. Like, yeah, this, this is a thing. You don't need to remember this thing. You can just remember the definition of conditional probability. And next thing is independence. So independence of two events is defined where the probability of A given B equals to the probability of A. And the probability of, this is equivalent, by the way. This means the same thing. B given A equals to the probability of B. Yeah? So it doesn't matter if B has happened, A will happen with the same probability. Doesn't matter if A has happened, B will happen with the same probability. So the fact that B has happened doesn't affect A. The fact that A has happened doesn't affect B. If this is the case, using using the definition of conditional probability, what you end up with is that this, I'm pretty sure that all of you know this, this is the most common way to ex express independence. The intersection of A and B equals to the, in the a, probability of A times the probability of B. So if A and B are independent, this is how you prove it. Everyone knows this. I think everyone who has done probability before, this is the easiest way, best thing to remember, easiest thing to remember, like easiest way to remember this thing. Cause you could remember it like this, but then you could accidentally get the inside swapped out. You don't remember that, just remember this. And from this, you can rederive that if you want. Okay. If y'all have any, we have finished the probability section. So if y'all have any questions about probability, 
If not, I will move on to combinatorics. Okay, I will move on to combinatorics. Combinatorics is basically the number of ways that things can happen. So as a relation with probability, where the number of ways that this event happens and the, divided by the total number of ways that it can happen is a probability that the event happens. But that's not something that is very crucially useful. You can figure that out on your own. Important things in combinatorics are, this is what is called a factorial. I assume that you probably know it by now. And so I do n times n minus one times n minus two times n minus three, and I go all the way until I reach one. Yeah. So this magical, magical number happens to be the number of ways to order n distinct items in n distinct items. Yes. So if I have n, Bob, and Clara, and I want to line them up in a line, the number of ways I can line them up is three factorial. And we call this thing a factorial. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, that's all you need to know about it. If I want to order them up, I just, if I, 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 I have the same amount of things and I want to put them in an order with this, I don't need to choose anything. Factorial, best friend, yes. And combinations and uh, per permutations will build off that. All good? Okay, next thing, combinations. Combinations has two ways to write it. And choose K. The C implies choose, which already gives you a hint as to what it does, which equals to N K. This is the binomial, but it's not something you need to care about. Which equals to N factorial, your best friend has returned, divided by N minus K factorial N factorial. So this is a number of ways to select k things from a group of n things. So I have n, Bob, and Clara again. What's the number of ways that I can select two of them? It's 3 factorial divided by 3 minus 2 is 1 factorial divided by, hmm, sorry, this should be, I made a mistake. This is the formula. So I'll say it again. It's n factorial divided by n minus k factorial times k factorial. Yeah. So if I want to, if I have a group of three things, n equals the three. If I want to choose two people from them, then I then k equals the two. So n is three. N minus k is one. K is two. And what I would get is three, but that's not what matters. It's just this formula. I have to remember. This one, you can't look at it and you will figure it out. So remember this one. Next thing is permutations. And permute k. So this one has a less intuitive naming, but it's just n factorial divided by n minus k factorial. And this n permute the like n permute k, I don't know how to say it actually, is the number of ways to select k items from uh, this group of distinct n items where the order you select them matters. So I'll go back to my favorite example, A, B, and Bob and Clara. And so over here, you can tell that N equals to three. The very specific question that I want answered, it's what's the ways, number of ways that I can get two of them where if Clara comes is selected first and Anne is selected second, 
it's different than if n is selected first and Clara is selected second. And so we would use our wonderful formula over here, k equals to two, because we're looking to we're looking to select two items, right? So it'd be three factorial divided by n minus no three minus two factorial, which equals to three factorial. But all you have to remember is the very important difference between choose and permute is that choosing is like, I'm trying to pick, pick the names out of a hat and it doesn't matter what order I pick them out of the hat. Permutation is like you're running a race. It matters whether or not you come first, second or third. So the or when the order matters, you use P. When the order does not matter, you use choose. Does that make sense? Okay, we will be moving on to statistics, which is my least favorite part of statistics. It's like the class is called econ statistics and I don't like statistics, but you know, it is what it is. There we go, okay. First thing, we'll just go through some definitions. You don't really need to know these definitions. You just need to know how to use them. Okay, so one, a random variable is a real valued number that depends on a random event. If he asks you to define it, it's useful. If not, just apply it like you do any other thing. Second thing, the cumulative di distribution function of a random variable is the function such that, okay, this one's useful, is the function Okay, let's say you have a random variable x. This is my random variable. Random variable. I'm gonna say RV from now on because writing random variable is very tedious. So this is the cumulative distribution function. This equals to the probability that this random variable is less than or equal to this number that was put in. So in practice, the cumulative function, the distribution function probably looks something like, I don't know, this. And then over here, we have one. And then it just reaches one because the probability can't get higher than one. And then the probability density function is you don't need to remember this definition so much. It's this integral that is kind of gross. The reason why you would write it like this integral is because not all probability density functions are integrable. Example of a pro, like a, a no, not all CDFs. Okay, I'm gonna call this cumulative distribution function. This is um, this one is the probability density function. Why would you write it like this instead of just saying, oh, I take the derivative of this df divided by d? Like I take the derivative equals to f x. Why on earth would I write it like this instead of just writing that? Excellent question. It's because like, it's just because not all cumulative distribution functions can be, you can take the derivative of it. An example of it would be something like this. And then you have like, like this or like this. And then you cough up and it's like this. And it's like this. And then you're like this, this, this. Basically, this is, you can't take the derivative. But in practice, if you're ever given a CDF, it will be, you will be able to take the derivative. Unless he's trying to mess with you in some way or another. So this is the formal definition, but you will probably never need it. I'll just remove this. 
Okay. And I want to illustrate a very important point. And that is for this probability density function, this is basically saying how much probability does event X happen at? And why can't I just say probability that X equals to X? And then I would just say that this equals to, like I integrated at X, right? The issue is that with continuous functions, I have a continuous function like this. I'm not sure how much calculus you all have done, but with continuous functions, the probability that this happens is zero. The probability that this happens is zero at all points. The probability that this specific point happens is zero. An example that I gave in the thing is like, if you're asking me to take the distance between me here and the blackboard over here, it'll be something like, okay, this would be something like 10 centimeters. But you can't say some, if it's continuous, you can't say it's something like 10 centimeters. You have to be like 10.3561732. Uh, like, so it's so specific that the probability that you are at that one single point just is zero all the time, which is why you need this definition where you would take the derivative. Does that make sense? Expectation. Okay, expectation of a discrete random variable. So knowing this, this is really important because I'm just saying this is for on the newest function. If it was not a continuous function, it's no problem. Because if you have discrete jumps, like if I was saying that I was rounding off to the nearest integer, what's the distance between me and the blackboard? 10 centimeters. Okay, there's a lot that would be rounded off to 10 centimeters, so it's fine. But for continuous functions, for all x, the random variable that you have that exact number happening, that probability is zero. Okay. And this informs a lot of how we define expectation and variance. And there is the, this is why we define expectation differently for continuous functions as we do for discrete, like discrete random variables, continuous ran, ran, random variables and discrete random variables. This is wrong, sorry. Continuous are random variables because this can take many, 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 many values. This can take infinitely many values, okay? So I will move on to expectation, unless you have any questions. That, I know that explanation could be a little confusing, so it's totally okay. If you have any questions, you can stop me at any time. Okay. So now we go into our uh, favorite topic, expectation. I'm gonna write it like this, expectation of X, where X is a random variable. So you take expectations of random variables. So expectation of the random variable is basically all the numbers that the random variable can take multiplied by the probability that it happens. It's basically the equivalent of taking the arithmetic mean. For a discrete random variable, so, okay, I will move this. If X is a discrete random variable, then what we would have the expectation of x equals to the sum of all 
possible values of x. This is the sum of all possible values of x multiplied the probability that this value of x happens. It's a fancy way of saying you're taking the average. If x is a continuous expectation of x. Okay, so suddenly you can't say the probability of that xi happens because as we mentioned, the probability that x equals to x i, let's say x i, equals to zero for everything, which is annoying again. So what we do is we take the integral from negative infinity to infinity of x. This is the value of x. This is the probability that this value of x happens if I take the integral, yeah? So this is the difference between the both of them. And the expectation is nice in one way, which is it is linear. So if I have two random variables, x, y, r, random variables, again, I will use my shortened notation for what a random variable is, then the expectation of a x plus b y equals to a expectation of x plus b expectation of y. This is called the linearity of expectation. It's basically saying if if I'm taking the average of x and like if I'm taking the arithmetic average of a x, okay, a the expectation is multiplied by a. If I'm taking the expectation of x plus y, I get the expectation of x plus the expectation of y. It's yeah, fairly straightforward. You just remember this because this is very important. Yes. Okay. And then another thing is. Jensen's inequality. I have never once used this in this class, but I don't want him to suddenly scare, like put some put a question on it, and then I did not cover it. So this is just for I don't know what he's saying. So if g is a convex function where the definition of a convex function is something which the second derivative is decreasing. Yes, convex, no, concave. No, second de derivative is increasing. Yes, convex is like this. Second derivative, increasing, yes, okay. Where g prime prime is greater than zero. No, the second derivative is positive. The derivative is increasing, sorry. But you will likely never do this, so. Then the expectation of g x is greater or equal to g of the expectation of x. We call this Jensen's inequality. Usually used for microeconomic theory where you would take like, it's like for expected utility, but I have never once used this in this class. So you can remember it, you can forget it. I'm pretty sure it'll just be a few marks that you would lose, but if you really want to care, this is not something you can figure out on your own. So remember it. Okay, next thing, variance. Oh, I don't like this place. Let me check the time. Okay, I um, feel like I'm on track-ish. Okay. Variance. Okay, it's also known as the second central moment of the distribution. The moment definition I didn't include because that would mostly be a definition question. And also, 
in general, the moment is just, there are only a few important moments. One is the first moment, which is expectation. Two is the second central moment, which is variance. And then the other ones not so. So variance of x equals to sigma squared. This 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 is a tautology. This is how we just this is just how we write the variance of x, okay? Which equals to the expectation of x minus its mean. Ooh. Admire it in all its glory. I don't know. It's it just is what is what it is. The standard deviation. Here's why we use this just now. Okay, so sigma square is variance. Standard deviation is sigma, which equals to the square root of the variance of x, which equals to the square root of expectation. Mm, yeah. By the way, this expectation is taking the outside of this. So you can't just look at this and be like, oh, look, there's a square root and a square. I just cancel it. That's not how it works. The expectation was taking like on the outside. So tough luck. Something that is also important to know is you should remember this M S minus S M which is that the variance of x equals to the mean of squares. So the mean is expectation of x squared minus the square of means. So the mean is expectation of x, and then I take that square. This is very easy to confuse because they look really similar. So the aim of this ms minus sm is mean of squares uh, minus square of means. And remembering this has made sure that I have never forgotten this ever. Even when I'm like, wait, which, which way around is it again? And then I just remember, oh, ms minus sm. OK, I know this. Yeah? So useful, remember, very important. Okay. So variance of a x equals to a square the variance of x. This is just how you take in and out the variance. Yeah. And next thing is if x and y are independent, we have that the variance of x minus y equals to the variance of x plus the variance of y. So it doesn't matter if inside it's a minus, the variance always increases, always. That's, like, that's why you don't have a negative variance. Okay. Next important thing, kind of. Hmm. Yes, okay. Is all of this clear so far? Okay, great. Uh, okay. So the next important thing is B inequality. So x is a random variable. Mu is the mean of x. Sigma square is the variance of x, yeah? And then you get this useful identity, which is that the probability that x minus mu is great, you take the modulus of that, is greater than 
L sigma is less than or equal to one over L squared. So now I will explain this. This happens for X with any random variable. Doesn't need to be a normal, doesn't need to be anything special. All it's saying is that when I take the modulus, by the way, what I'm saying is I'm taking the distance between X and mu. Doesn't matter if mu is bigger, doesn't matter if X is bigger, I, I'm taking, I'm like taking the distance and then I'm making it positive. This, the probability that the distance between X and mu is greater than L sigma is less than or equal to one over L square, which basically means that over here, let's say this here is mu. And the doesn't even need to be, yeah, it doesn't even need to be a random variable. All it's saying is that if I, the further out I go, I go all the way here or further, but where this is L sigma, this probability over here is less, is, is less than one over L squared. So you're bounding the probability. So this is the highest probability that it can be, which is useful. And this is something you should also remember because this is not really something that you can de derive in your exam, but he will most, prob most probably ask you about this. Okay. All clear about this? This is important. What is L again? L is any number. L can be one, L can be two, L can be three, L can be, yeah, L can be 0 0.1. You choose L. Because all I, what I want to say is that what's the probability that, let's say I want to say what's the probability that it's beyond here. Actually, I made a mistake because it's not only over here, right? It's also minus L sigma. So this plus this has to be one over L squared. Okay, but if I want to know what's the probability that it's outside of here, where this is just a number that I like, then let's say this is k sigma, no, minus k sigma, this is k sigma. I know this number and then I divide it. I know I want the distance, like this much distance from the mean, and I divide it by sigma to get k. So like this k, just like this l, can be anything. I just know that I want, what's the probability that it's further than here? So the probability that we get is that it must be less than one over k squared. Okay, great. Very important. You need to know how to use this because this is, this is, he's definitely gonna ask you like uh, an example of how it'll be asked. What is the, what is the upper bound of the probability that like this, is further than three, like the random variable is further than three standard deviations away from the mean. That's when L equals to three, then this is one over nine. So yeah, it's, it, it, is, it, is, it is useful. It is something you will use in your life. All good? Awesome. Next thing. Okay. Join CDF of X1 and X2. So F, we call it X1 comma X2, where I have X1, X2. This equals to the probability that x1 is less than x1. By the way, these are the random variables and these are 
random, these are just numbers that we pick. Okay. So it's a problem. So this is the define how we define f x one comma x two is defined as the probability that random variable x one is less than or equal to x one, and the probability like no sorry. And random variable x two is less than or equal to x two. The probability that these two happen at the exact same time, that's the that's what you get for the joint. CDI. And if you look through the notes and probably some examples, really good example to do is the 2020 uh, final exam for this. 2020 final question one, but it's very tedious. So that's why I didn't put it in here. But what you do is you look through the question, you look through the answer, and he basically does something similar to this. I'll just move on and I'll tell you exactly what he did. Okay. So conditional probability. Uh, probability of y given x equals to the probability of x and y. Sorry. I just realized I made a mistake. Yes, the probability of x and y x, y divided by the probability of x. Yeah, this is the same thing as the Bayes theorem kind of deal because which equals to the probability of x1 less than x1 intersection x2 less than x2. Wait, crap, sorry. I was copying wrong. I will restart this explanation. This was not great. I will redo it. I don't want to confuse, confuse you. Okay, so let's see. Let's see. Okay, restarting an explanation. The, pro the conditional probability distribution function, which we write like this equals to the distribution function of x and y, the joint distribution function of x and y, divided by the distribution function of x. And if we write it like this, you can see why. Because over here, how it, the joint dif distribution function is defined is I take the probability of x less than or equal to x and y less than or equal to y, divided by the probability that x is less than or equal to x. But if you look at this, this is basically saying, remember the definition of conditional probability. This is saying the probability of y less than or equal to y given x less than or equal to x, which is exactly what we wanted in the first place. Does that make sense? And yeah, all good, okay. So for the continuous case, it's the exact same thing, except instead of having the probabilities as, remember continuous case is annoying, you don't have exact probability for this one case, then you would have the probability density function. Like this. How do you remember these things? You just remember the definition of conditional probability and this definition, and then this follows. Actually, this definition would be better if I did like this. And then you can see it easier that it follows. Does that make sense? If you have any questions about this, I know this explanation was confusing. All right, we will be moving to independence of continuous random variables. We're nearly through this part that I really don't like. Okay. Um, okay. So in the same way that you would know that two 
I'll erase this and then I will show you the parallels. If, how would you know that two events A and B are independent? If A intersection B equals to probability A times probability of B. In the exact same way, if you want to find that two continuous random variables are independent, it means that f x y Make sense? Because this implies that f y given x equals to f y y, which means that x and y are independent. Good? Any questions about this? Or anything that we covered before? It's all chill. I like if you got stuck on something, it's better to ask. And I can clarify it for you. Okay, next thing. Covariance. Actually, before I mention covariance, all I'll say is in the, I think 2020 final, let me take a look at it. Okay, the 2020 final, um, question one, part A, this, it's related to this question. Yeah, it is kind of a bit. Okay. Next thing, covariance. Okay, so how do we define the covariance? It's covariance of x and y equals to the expectation of x minus mu x, y minus mu y. And we also have something called correlation. Which is actually just the correlation of x and y equals to the covariance x, y divided by sigma x, sigma y. Why do we have this correlation? It's because when you divide it by sigma x and sigma y, then you get the actual, you get the actual correlation of how both of them move together. Whereas if you have a big sigma x and a big sigma y, you sometimes you wouldn't get that exact value. Because yeah, let's say sigma x is really big, then you would think the, the covariance would be really high, and you're like, oh, okay. They're really correlated, but all it's all it was saying is that sigma x is really big and the actual covariance itself is very low. Like, no, sorry, the actual correlation itself is very low. Make sense? Okay. And then some useful formulas for you. Covariance of x with itself is just equal to this squared. It's just equal to expectation of x minus mu x square, which you happen to happily see that this is the variance of x. So the covariance of a random variable with itself is okay. Yes, okay. So I will repeat that one more time. How do you know that two variables move together a lot? You could look at their covariance, but then the covariance is influenced by the variance of 
the variance of x and the variance of y. So let's say if this number is really big. How do you know that this number is really big just because this, like, the variance of each individual thing is really high versus the actual correlation is really high? So what correlation does is you take the covariance of x and y and then you divide by the standard deviation of x and the standard deviation of y. And then this shows you how much they actually move together instead of covariance, which can be big because the standard deviation is big. But correlation, since you're dividing by the standard deviation, then it normalizes it. Does that make sense? Okay. So yes, this is also something very useful. Covariance of x with x is the variance of the term. And just now, remember, I said that if x and y are independent, then the variance of x minus y is the variance of x plus the variance of y. Here, if x and y are, there are no conditions. You don't have to say it's independent. Then the variance of x plus y equals to the variance of x plus the variance of y minus the covariance of x and y. Actually, give me a second. I need to check something. Um, okay, that was, I was right. This is wrong. It should be two covariance of x and y. So sorry about that. I will change the notes to update that. Because as I was writing it, I was like, wait, hold on. That sounds suspicious. So I'll say it again. The variance of x plus y equals to the variance of x plus the variance of y minus two covariance of x and y. Easy way to remember it is like the a plus b square formula thing. And like a minus b square formula. Yeah. OK, all good. Sorry, that got a little confusing. Is that okay? All right, moving swiftly on to distributions. Oof, I better move faster. First one, Bernoulli. Random variable x follows Bernoulli. If x has two outcomes, x1 and x2. x1 happens with probability p, x2 happens with probability 1 minus p. That's why is it two covariants? Oh, that requires a lot of, I could write it out, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write it out afterwards and then I'll add it. Because basically what you do is you just literally, you throw it into the formula and then you expand, 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 expand until it happens. <laughs> that was actually one of our homework assignments. It's not, it, it's not complicated, it's just long. So I'll send it to you afterwards. Sounds good? But you basically don't need to. Yes, okay. So this is Bernoulli. Binomial. X binomial and so you can think of binomial as n times of a Bernoulli. 
So Bernoulli is like you flip a coin once. It's either heads or tails with half and half probability. Binomial is like, let's say I flip a coin 10 times, then n would be 10, p would be half, and then you have that x, x equals to y1 plus y2 plus dot 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 plus y10, where all of these are Bernoulli. Good? Okay. Next thing is the Poisson, which is used to model data that are counts of the number of times that something happens. I have never used this in this class. Don't think you'll need it too. Uh, we have the exponential, which is used as a model of continuous positive functions, like waiting times in a room. I've used this in the class before, but for an assignment, not an exam. But he gave the formula for it. So there's nothing else you need to know other than exponential is used for continuous positive functions. The normal distribution is a really important one. Happens a lot in real life. Most common application is that the distribution of the sample means of any distribution, as you take more and more sample means, it goes towards a normal distribution. It has two parameters, the mean and the variance, which is why you would write it as x mu sigma squared. This is how you write a normal. A standard normal. Yeah. Is a special, special, special x where x is distributed by zero and one. The reason why turns from this to this is mostly historical reasons is because if I take x minus mu divided by sigma of this, it follows n zero one. So before computers, when you would need to manually calculate this, you don't want to manually calculate every single normal distribution table. So you just calculate the standard normal distribution table. You turn every other normal, like random variable into a standard normal, and then you compute it from there. But yeah. Okay. And then, Student t distribution used when we don't know the population variance of the distribution. So sometimes this, that sigma square over there, we don't know. So we use s square. And s square is something that we can find by running experiments. But if we run these experiments, you can't use the normal distribution anymore because it's not exactly the same, right? So what we do is we use the t distribution, where you take the mean is mu, the variance is s square, and the degrees of freedom is n minus one, where n is the amount of like tries that you do to get to this sample variance. Make sense? And as, and as as the number of degrees of freedom becomes higher and higher and higher and higher and higher, it converges towards a normal distribution because it becomes more and more like the actual normal distribution. And then last thing, last distribution is the, the chi-square distribution, which is sums of independent squared standard normal random variables. And yeah, I don't think like me telling you what distribution is, this distribution is, is very useful. So I'll just show you how it's used later. There's a theorem that linear combinations of normal random variables are normal. And so if x1 <laughs> normal zero, A1 sigma 1 square, x2 is normal, 0, A2 sigma 2 square, 
So we go on and on until we have x and and zero a and sigma n square. Then if we sum up all of these, no oh wait, sorry, this is a mistake. Sorry, take that back. This is sigma one square, sigma two square, and this is sigma n square. Okay, so I'll repeat it again. These are all normal random variables. Mean of zero, the reason why we can leave it as a mean of zero is because all you need to do is take x1 minus mu and you would get the mean of zero already. So it's really easy to get the mean of zero. And then here's your variance. And then if I, if I take a linear combination of these, which equals to, let's say, a1 x1 plus a2 x2 plus dot 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 plus a n x n, then what I would get is that y, amazingly, is also normal. And it follows this, it has its same mean, which makes sense. And then the variance is this, uh, pi square sigma pi square. Sounds good. Okay. I'll just quickly move through sample mean because the sample mean is basically, yeah, it's just the arithmetic mean. So I do n trials and then I multiply, I sum all the results of the n trials and I divide it by the number of trials I take is the mean of all the trials that you took. And then a more important thing is the weak law of large numbers. I, this is, yes. So if you have independent random draws from a distribution with the cumulative distribution function, of, uh, okay, doesn't matter. All you need to know is If these are all independent draws that, that create the sample mean, then as you take more and more and more and more and more data points, what you're getting is that it becomes closer and closer and closer and closer and closer, and closer to the mean. So the probability that it's very, 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 very close to the mean is one. And the more important application is that when n is greater than sigma square over epsilon square delta, then the probability that epsilon is, oh, I made a mistake, but okay. The probability that x is within this epsilon is equal is greater or equal to one minus delta. This one I could explain to you, but honestly, you just remember this. So as the error bound gets smaller, epsilon gets smaller, so you need more data. If you wanna be more certain, that means that you need to delta to decrease because you want to be more certain, you want to go closer and closer to one, delta needs to go closer and closer to zero. If delta goes closer and closer to zero, you need more data to make that happen. <coughs> okay. And then, I think I'll skip over theorem 6.1 because that seems like something that you will, it's just something that you used to use to prove the next. So I'll give you that the sample mean minus the actual mean 
divided by this is the standard error divided by number of trials follows a student t distribution. And this is the case because if you read in the notes, normal distribution, chi-square distribution. Yeah? And so I know that you all covered until confidence intervals. So I want to show this really quickly. The probability that you are within this quartile. This is how you solve all confidence interval questions. They all look the same. It's all like this, okay? This probability that you're within this, within this quartile where it's equal to one minus alpha. How do we get this number? It's simple. You open up your book or you open up your probability table and you look for student t distribution. You find n minus one. And then you know your alpha. Alpha is always given to you. If it's not given to you, assume it's 0 0.05. So then you then you can find Q 0 0.025 for student T distribution and then you just minus it. Make sense? Okay. And to solve for this, you multiply this over. And then you you solve. For, you're trying to solve for mu. So what you do is you x minus two less than mu is less than equals to x plus s over square root of n. So what you end up having is that mu is inside x, the, the sample mean, plus minus snq alpha over 2 with 1 minus alpha probability. And this is how you get the confidence interval. Is there any part that you don't understand? Because this is the one of the most important things that you need to know, especially for this final exam, it's going to be the most tested thing. At least that's my guess. So at this point, you just multiply this over on both sides. You flip them, but then since they're symmetrical, it doesn't matter. You move the sample mean over, and then you get this beautiful, beautiful confidence interval with this probability. So if a well, if alpha was 5%, this would be with 95% probability, mu is somewhere here, which is amazing. OK. OK. Then central limit theorem. Also important. Okay, I'll hurry up. Oops. Central limit theorem. So it's just saying that those two in distribution degrees. It's literally saying that this goes to the in distribution to n zero one. This thing. So let's say you know the sample mean. Let's also say that of course you know the number of trials that you did for your sample mean. And most importantly, you assume that you know this 
standard deviation. Then, as you take, if, if, as n gets bigger and bigger, it follows the normal distribution. Yes, okay, so when you're finding mu, you find the interval that it lies in, not the actual value. Why? It's because there is the variance that makes you not sure about where it actually is. Just like, like for, for the random variable x itself, it lies in a range, right? So if I get a few data points on where it is in the range, that means that I can be reasonably sure if I got these few data points that is not out here or out here with 95% probability. But I cannot tell you that with these, like with all of these data points, even if all the data points look like this and they're all around here, there's still the probability that it's out here or out here, which is why I cannot say it's definitely this. Otherwise it would not be a random variable. A random variable is something that is like, it depends on a random event. So I cannot tell you that mu is definitely this. I can tell you the center of all the things that mu could be, which would be the sample mean. But how confident am I? Like, how can I say with 95%, I'm 95% sure that my, my actual mu is here. Like 95% sure. I'm very close to certain then I would do the whole confidence interval calculation. Because basically what you're doing is that you're running the experiment many times. And once you run this experiment many times, what you get is the data points of which you would get the sample mean over here. And then so your data points would probably look something like this, where it's like, like, like this-ish, right? But it does not eliminate the possibility that mu could be here and you were just extremely unlucky. Like imagine like, oh, they all happen to be, I happen to all get, like imagine that the real distribution is like this. And I was just super unlucky and I got all of these values. What is the probability of that? What we're saying is that the probability of that happening if you're within this confidence interval, if, like, if this is outside that confidence interview, interval, the probability of mu being outside of this confidence interval is less than 5%. So we cannot eliminate the, the probability altogether, but we can say that it's tiny. It probably isn't the case. Does that make sense? Or if you have any follow-up questions, I'd be happy to answer them. All good, okay. And so central limit theorem, the most important thing, central limit theorem is just saying this, okay? It converges in distribution to this. So as N gets bigger, it becomes like this. But the most key assumption that central limit theorem makes, which is why you cannot slap it everywhere, okay? This is very important. The reason why is because you need to know this. You need to know the standard deviation, which is usually not something that you have. So that's why you usually use the student t distribution. Because usually what you have is you can estimate s square, and you can also estimate X, uh, the sample, like sample mean of X. So in that sense, you would be able to use the student T distribution, but you can use the more powerful standard normal distribution if and only if you know what this is. You cannot, you cannot put S here. If you put S here, this is wrong. Like this would not hold. This must be the standard deviation, not the standard. Okay, trend mean. I don't feel like it's useful. I'm just gonna skip over that now. You can just look at it by yourself. Sample variance 
It's a formula. Remember the formula. Relation between variance and sample variance. This is important. So n minus one square over sigma square follows the chi square distribution. Okay. As soon as you know that it follows a distribution like this, you can find a confidence interval for sigma square. In the exact same way that I showed you how to do a confidence interval just now, you can find a confidence interval for sigma square. Does that make sense? Because like you can find the, let's say you want alpha equals to 0 0.05. You can find the quartiles for alpha equals to 0 0.05 when it's a chi-square distribution for n minus 1. And then what, you, and you already know s square, you know n minus 1. So you just rearrange it and it turns into what you want. There's nothing more special than that. It is, it is, it is just that. Standard error is basically, yeah, okay. Standard error is the square root of the sample variance. Coefficient of skewness is that formula that I gave in the notes, and it's a measure of asymmetry. Coefficient of kurtosis, also the formula I gave in the notes, is the measure of how spread out the data is. And sample covariance and sample correlation is has the same, is the same analog to actual covariance and actual correlation. So I don't feel like I need to cover this now. And if all is good, if you all have any questions, if not, we can work through some problems. Like any questions about anything that we've covered or anything that we haven't covered and you wanna know about? All good, okay. For the notes, oh, I'll, yes, do you, I will send them again. Let me just, sorry, here we go. Got it? Awesome, okay. Now we will do some exercises. Since we have 15 minutes left, I want to skip straight to the problems that I feel like were funky, so they don't scare you. So let's like, I'll move to exercise 7.2 first. And we have time, if we have time, we'll move to the other problems. So consider the following game of chance. A player pays a fee, Y, to play a game. The player flips a coin continuing until a tail comes up, with payoff to det be determined by the number of hits in a row that they obtain, no denoted by N. The payoff is N to the power, no, two to the power of N minus one for N is greater than zero. So if the first flip is a tail, no payment. If the first flip is a head, then the player goes on. If the second flip is a head, then they, you get paid two to the power of zero. And da 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 da. So the game continues until you get a tail. The player's profit is the payoff that they get minus how much they paid. Okay? So what you need to do is you give an expression for the expected value of the player's payoff and simplify the expression as much as possible. So how would I do that? The expectation of the expected value of the payoff, let's say I call the payoff a random variable y. No, sorry, y is taken, x, okay. x is the payoff, okay? So there's a half probability that you get no payoff at all. Yeah? And then... Yes, okay. Plus half probability that you get two to the power of n 
Um, second flip is a tail. Okay, yeah. Half probability that you get two to the power of n. This one. Yeah. No, it's two to the power of one. Okay. Give me a second. I need to think about this. Okay. Second flip. Okay, so if the first step is ahead, the pair goes off. If you fail at this, you get a, pro a payoff of zero. If you fail at, sorry, this should be this. That's so you pass the first coin, the the first the first coin flip, but you fail the second coin flip. Then you would get a payoff of two to the power of zero. Plus one over eight, two to the power of one, plus one over 16. So basically, I'll just. Actually, no, this is half. Half, half to the power of two, half to the power of three. Two to the power of two plus half to the power of four, two to the power of six. And it goes on and on and on and on. And what you end up with, ah, okay. And what you end up with is that you actually find that this simplifies to. Um, two to the power of minus one. Actually, give me a second. I need to check something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Wait, really? Oh, okay, yes, sorry. Made another mistake. Uh, this should be square. This should be cube. This should be power of four. This should be the power of five. Let me explain why, okay? So over here, with half a probability, you get tails. If you tails, game stops, and eh, you're out. You get, you didn't even get one hit. So here it stops. Over here, you have half times half. So this is the probability that the first round you get hits, the second round you get tails. After you hit tails, and you're out. So this is two to the power of zero because you had one hits in total. Over here, what's the probability that the first round you get hits, Second round, you get hits. Third round, you get tails and you're out. It's this, which is that, yeah. Same thing goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And it's entirely possible that you can get 100 heads in a row. It's not very likely, but it's possible. So then what you would have is two to the power of zero. 2 to the power of negative 2 times 2 to the power of 0 plus 2 to the power of negative 3 times 2 to the power of 1 plus dot 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 dot. <laughs> this equals to 2 to the power of negative 2n. Wait, sorry. Um, 2 to the power of negative 2 plus 2 to the power of negative 2. Sorry, okay. It's 2 to the power of negative 2 plus 2 to the power of negative 2 plus 2 to the power of negative 2 plus dot dot dot, which equals to n 2 to the power of negative 2, which equals to n over 4. So what you have is that as n goes to infinity, which we have, <laughs> n is infinity, the expectation of this is infinity. So actually, I can't even put n because there's infinitely many. 
So you just have to stop here. So, but if you keep, let's say if I add one quarter plus one quarter plus one quarter plus one quarter plus one quarter, plus one quarter this expectation is infinite, which was kind of trippy to have on a final exam question. And I thought I was going crazy, but you know, that, that's just to say that sometimes the questions are wonky. And then the next part of the question is saying that if the player pays a fee of $5 to pay, play, compute the probability that the player will make a profit. So let's say two, two, two. The probability that they make a profit is the probability that he doesn't lose it here, 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 and here. So it's one minus half minus half square minus half cube minus half to the power of four. The reason why this is the case is because from here on out, two to the power of three is greater than five. So the only way you will lose money is if you get one tail, no, one, zero hits, one hit, two hits, or three hits. That's how you lose money. So this equals to one minus half minus one quarter minus one eighth minus one sixteenth is one over sixteen. That's the problem. Yeah. Oof. Nine more minutes. Um, okay, I'll do one more confidence interval question because that's the most likely to appear. Um, actually, no, I just want to. I think I'll take the last nine minutes to ask questions. I did not realize that it would take this long to cover everything. But like, if you have any questions about econ stats at all, please feel free to ask anything. It doesn't matter. There's, it's always a good question and you're friends can learn from it. Any questions? Awesome. Yes, and if also if you have any feedback for me, you can always message me and I will get better. Okay, yeah, if not, then thanks for coming and I will make sure this recording is uploaded expeditiously. <laughs>